How about if we wait a couple more minutes um, and then we can, uh, we'll get going. And if more people show up, um, Ellie will uh, be able to let them in. We're very grateful that Tadwig has been so uh, organized in setting up the events. They've given us great advice about how to run them and uh, the success. So they're helping both with the technical side of things, uh, running things for us and with advice about what makes a su successful session. everybody to this um, citizen science uh, interest group um, where um, uh, this is a um, Tadwig 2020 working sessions. Uh, this is ITG 13, the citizen science um, interest group. Uh, I'm Rob Stevenson. I'm your moderator. Um, I have co-moderators uh, with Libby Elwood and uh, Peter Brenton and um, we're the people who uh, organize this group and we have support from um, a number of people uh, who uh, helped organize this whole um, series of, of sessions, uh, Tad Wig Central. Um, uh, and so we're grateful for their help during the conference. Um, the session is being recorded uh, for later viewing. Uh, we thank all of you for for joining us and we thank our, we'll have a bunch of several speakers. We thank them too. Um, the basic format will be a few uh, opening remarks. I'll give a short uh, couple minutes worth of remarks. Then uh, Libby will give a, a more formal uh, talk uh, about her, about an overview about citizen science and biodiversity and where we think that's going. And then we'll have four different people, three or four different people, um, join us and talk about their projects and where they see issues of uh, biodiversity, um, data quality and citizen science going. Um, Marshall Iliff from eBird is with us today. Um, Scott Laurie from iNaturalist is here. And uh, John Sullivan um, is here from uh, New Zealand. Um, and uh, Christy Simmons said she might join us. I haven't seen her list yet, but she might be here. And I'm hoping that all of them will be able to join us and present. Um, I wanted to, to remind you that um, the chat function is being made available mainly for technical issues. And we have people that can help with technical issues if, if something goes wrong. Um, please uh, keep your microphone muted. Um, and uh, if there are difficulties, relax. And, and my experience with Zoom is that usually we can get it going again pretty quickly. So just stay calm. Um, I wanted to start uh, by giving people a chance to say hello to one another. And to do that, uh, I have a, an icebreaker for us. Uh, I'm going to paste in a, 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 a link to a Google, a Google uh, spreadsheet where you can list your favorite biodiversity apps. Put down your name and your favorite biodiversity apps. And this will be part of a breakout room where you can talk to other people about your interest in biodiversity and what apps uh, you use and, and what apps you think we should try. So there's also a column that says, you know, uh, uh, this is the one I think I should try. All right, so here comes the, uh, here comes the link. Let's see, I need to change this to everyone. Everyone in the meeting and I need to type that in there and then go. And you can, you can go to this. Google works great for multiple people putting in things. You can go to this link and put your name in your favorite apps. And then once we've got that going, we can, um, we can uh, start to think about um, uh, the breakout rooms and introducing ourselves and our interests and why we, why we think citizen science is so important uh, for biodiversity.
Uh, Christy says she's here. That's great. Are people getting access to the Google Doc okay? Is that working? I haven't heard any complaints. Usually when I have students online, they immediately go, the link's not working. Do something quick. I see smiles, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming everybody else has their microphone turned off so politely, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it's working. Yeah, lots of things are going in there. It's getting populated pretty quickly. So I think um, <laughs> whenever, um, Ellie, I'm not sure if you're the one moving us, but whenever you can, we're ready to go to our groups. Okay, I will send you off to your groups. Yes. There's going to be six breakout rooms um, and off you go. What do we do when we get there? <laughs> You'll be there for about um, eight minutes or so. We're going to do some intros with whoever's in your room and then talk about the app set you're putting into the spreadsheet there. Off they go. Jeff, uh, Scott is here. Good. <laughs> um, all right, everybody, I hope you've returned. Um, you had a, had a chance to share your favorite biodiversity apps, and I didn't get a chance but, to see the whole list, but the, uh, the list I did see had iNAT way up there. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I, it's a little, people's favorite for a, a lot of reasons because it's so broad. It covers so many species. Um, um, it, and it, it teaches us a lot now as well as allowing us to share many of our observations. Okay, the, the, uh, I'm just going to repeat this because so many people have joined us. We're going to have a couple... I'm going to say just to uh, spend a couple minutes uh, talking about my motivation, and then and then um, we're going to have uh, Libby uh, Elwood, another organizer, uh, share some of the advances that are happening in citizen science and biodiversity monitoring and discovery. Then um, <clears throat> we're going to have some pre presenters who are running projects. Uh, um, Marshall Isla from iNaturalist, I mean from eBird, Scott Laurie from iNaturalist, John uh, Sullivan uh, from New Zealand, who's a, got a sort of a personal project, and then Christy Simmons from Reef will, will give us some, uh, share some of their thoughts about citizen science and biodiversity and where we're going. And then we'll come back and um, have, a, have another uh, share session. And then finally, uh, the, the most important technical person in our group, Peter Brenton from <clears throat> the Atlas of Living Australia, um, who is by trade a software developer, is going to talk about some of the challenges he faces um, in terms of integrating data from all the different projects in Australia and some of the infrastructure that they're working on that may benefit all of us and help develop standards for citizen science projects. So that's our agenda. Okay, so I'm just going to launch into the motivation here. I am uh, very, very worried about the loss of biodiversity, as I'm sure most of the people here are. That's motivated many, many of us to um, monitor and participate in programs. And um, uh, whether it's climate change that you worry about or loss of habitat or uh, over harvesting, or it, it could be uh, you're, you're worried like I am very much just about the standing of science uh, in, in the world. Right now, um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a difficulty with people even accepting any kind of science. So I like to say to people, that's a fine statement, but where's your evidence? Um, what, what evidence do you actually have for that idea? And so the great thing about citizen science is not only is it getting more evidence about biodiversity than any other method right now, and I think it will continue to so, but Almost as importantly, and maybe more importantly, it engages the public. And engaging the public and growing the community and getting them to participate is the way that we can communicate this. Coming from uh, conserving biodiversity or saving biodiversity or saving habitat is not something that scientists are, have been very successful doing. We've been talking about it a long time, but it hasn't happened very much. So I'm hoping that 
my, my positive spin on this is I'm hoping that people in their own communities taking action and participating in multiple ways will uh, help uh, turn it around. So that's, that's my motivation. I'm glad you're here. Um, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Libby now. Uh, she's going to just uh, uh, help us um, uh, with some general thoughts about uh, how co contributions from citizen science programs are helping with biodiversity research and conservation. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob, for that introduction. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today from wherever you are and whatever time it is. I'm going to hopefully share this um, screen with you and this PowerPoint rolling. It's clear from the, um, the sheet that you guys filled out in the breakout groups that everybody's pretty familiar with, iNaturalist and eBird and a lot of Digivol. Um, things on there too. And so I'm just going to talk about some other directions that um, citizen science is going because they're just, um, it's growing by leaps and bounds really. And with a lot of new technologies and more affordable technologies, this is making it even easier for citizen scientists to participate in really groundbreaking research. And so eDNA, environmental DNA, is one way that um, is just kind of starting to branch out into citizen, or I'll refer to it either as citizen or community science because our institution has changed the way we refer to that. So apologies that I um, kind of use those interchangeably. Um, so eDNA enables researchers to determine species occurrences just from water samples. And of course, many of those tasks are um, things that citizen scientists can contribute to. And as this becomes more affordable, we'll um, definitely be seeing more of these types of projects out there. Um, similarly with drones and the ability to, um, to monitor conservation, to monitor um, species occurrences from afar or from, uh, from areas that are, or of areas that are less accessible or sensitive or uh, for whatever reason, we don't want to visit them. Uh, drones are one way that we can do that. And of course, uh, here too, citizen scientists are able to help in some of these steps. And um, this is an example from the University of Arizona, where community scientists are using drones to monitor water conservation, um, wildlife movements, and they're monitoring invasive plant species, all just and through these thermal sensing it's drones. So and of course, then on the other end, there are just tons of data that are collected from different types of these technologies and camera traps are another one that have grown in popularity, not just from citizen science systems themselves putting these out there, although that's certainly part of it, but researchers putting them out there and then citizen scientists working with the data by maybe classifying what's in the image or annotating it in some way. And these are really, really popular projects on some of the, um, the platforms like Zooniverse and Digivolve that seem to be able to even keep them filled with um, uh, with images. And in the future, things like DNA barcoding will hopefully become um, more applicable and more easy to use for everybody, including citizen scientists. And so um, Dan Jensen is um, really spearheading this effort and hopefully in years to come, we'll see even just this really readily accessible and very easy to use technology that can help us with species identifications on the fly out in the field um, will, will come to light. So those are a few of the um, kind of technologies out there that are advancing us beyond um, the typical smartphone type apps that are out there and, and really dominating things right now. Although uh, I do want to spend some time, just a few minutes looking at some of the data that are collected through some of the apps that uh, were mentioned in the spreadsheet there that, that end up in sites like GBIF. And a big thank you to John Waller, who, um, unbeknownst to him, <laughs> wrote, um, provided the, um, some figures here that I'm going to use to help demonstrate just how far citizen science has come and how we can see that in the GBIF database. So um, the rise of citizen science on the GBIF network is really pretty astonishing. And right now, this, this is actually from um, January 2019. So it's even these lines are even closer now, but um, G our citizen science data make up over half of the data that are in GBIF right now, half of the occurrence data. 
And most of the large data sets on GBIF are citizen science data sets. So you could see the green bars there uh, with eBird really having a stronghold on the citizen science um, occurrence data in um, in GBIF and all those other green bars to represent citizen science projects. So um, in total, they make up quite a large sum. Interestingly, though, citizen science is less biodiverse than professional science. And so you'll see here the green line on the bottom represents um, by genus the number of species that citizen scientists are um, observing and uh, making records of that are ingested by GBIF uh, compared to the black line much higher, which is um, occurrence data collected by professional scientists. And I think this is something that we can look towards uh, improving going forward. And as Rob said, I think um, conservation and biodiversity loss are really driving a lot of the work that we do and the research that we do. And part of this is understanding and documenting the species that are out there above and beyond those that are most common to us. And it's not even to say that we have to go to far flung places um, out there in the world, but uh, I think even promoting projects that do think about species beyond those that are most common in our backyards can really help to bring this bar up. So those are things that um, I'm looking forward to moving forward in community science and citizen science and um, and hearing from some of the speakers today to hear their perspectives on this and, and to think about how all these data together and helping these data make sure that they can really talk to each other and intermingle in a friendly way so that they are most usable for research and education and policy and all these really critical things that we are doing with the data um, to ensure that we can, can address our um, biodiversity goals. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the um, next speaker. And Rob, remind me who that is. Well, turn it back to me. All right. I'll, you I'll introduce them. Uh, cool. I just want to say a couple words. Um, uh, outside of uh, the, the uh, outsiders have the perception that data, uh, that citizen science has poor data quality. Um, and and um, they, they think that we're just amateurs. Um, scientists themselves also have seemed pretty skeptical. I haven't seen a lot of uh, professional biologists joining citizen science, although I see more and more now. Um, uh, we happen to think that, that uh, in fact, citizen science scientists can produce very good data and that uh, the, the managers of projects are always very worried about this and thinking about it very hard. Um, so uh, I've asked the next uh, series of presenters, starting with Marshall Eilif, to, to um, talk about um, uh, their projects and how they think about data quality, what they're doing, and maybe what they think the next challenges are. So go ahead, uh, Marshall, take, take control and tell us a little bit about eBird. Okay, is that, is that working? Can you all see? Yes, uh, you can, you can uh, fill the screen if you want. You've got, uh, yeah, there you go. Is that better? <clears throat> it's not filling my screen. I'm seeing all the uh, next slides still instead of the focus on the, so uh, you want to go. Right. Anyone know how to take this out of? Yeah, yeah, just a second. If you. How do I get this out of? Yeah, if you go to uh, um, the uh, view and there we go. There you, go. So you did it. Sure. Did I do it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Marshall Isle from one of the eBird project leaders, and I really focus a lot on data quality. So um, I'll just give a really quick run through to make sure everyone's on the same page for what eBird is. Uh, we really have developed eBird to try to tap into the global network of truly millions of bird watchers around the world to, to collect not just the birds that they see, but to do it in a checklist format where we can um, collect complete checklists of birds whenever possible. So that, that turns basically every bird watching event into a survey of the complete list of birds around you. Um, we focus a lot on data entry to try to make it as easy and fun as possible. Um, and so 
not just on the website, but through um, iPhone and mobile apps, um, iPhone and Android mobile apps in multiple languages, um, as slick as we can make them to, to try to make data entry as easy as possible. Um, we really tap into the things that drive bird watchers, which is uh, they're all list hungry. They all want to get that next life bird. So we have a lot of tools that, that really incentivize that um, sort of competitive with yourself, sometimes competitive with others mentality of trying to find that new next bird. Um, and, and really try to develop uh, pretty useful and educational output tools that, that tap into the data and summarize it. So on the left, that's a, the migration charts for various thrushes in, in the UAE. And, um, and on the right is a point map where you can really drill down and see specific, specific data for every species. Um, so having, having that positive feedback between the data you enter and your contributions showing up on maps and graphs and everything is really critical to everything we do. And we try to do everything with science in mind. And, and this is a migration model for magnolia warblers. They move north um, out of Central America into um, the United States and Canada to breed and then coming back. So this is, this is using eBird data, um, trying to correct for all the biases and, um, and tapping it into a species distribution model. But every, every piece of eBird, we try to think, how will this get us more data, better data, um, more useful data? And I should say, I, I do think there's something special about birds. Like not only are they beautiful, but they, they really engage people around the world. So um, what, when eBird started, we were standing on the shoulders of a century of amateur ornithologists that had grown up and sort of taken over the field from professional ornithologists in terms of thinking about bird distribution, occurrence, migration patterns, and population decline. So there was already a long history of citizen science in the, in the bird world. Um, that eBird really benefited from. Um, the other thing about birds that's, that's sort of unique when you compare it to a fungus or a lizard or a frog or something, um, we know their distributions really well, but birds have wings and they use them and they migrate all sorts of different places and they make mistakes when they migrate, so they turn up out of range. And the result is that um, even though we know very well where birds occur, they're always surprising us with with new records and bird watchers are sort of hypercharged to go seek those out of range and um, unexpected birds. So, so data quality is kind of a special challenge for us in that regard. The real um, existential challenge that we're facing is that eBird is continuing to grow at 30 or 40% a year, um, exponential growth and, and it just puts a bigger and bigger burden on our data quality network. So, um, so we're really worried about making sure that we scale with growth on data quality. And so we're doing a lot on that front these days. Um, and just a totally boring slide here to try to make sure that I hit a few things about eBird that I feel like feel important to say. Um, so sort of unlike INAT, we encourage vouchers, specimens, uh, you know, photos or audio recordings, but they're not required. So a lot of our observations are just someone saying, I saw X bird at X place. Um, we vet not just the identification of the, of the records, but also the counts that people report. Um, and we do that with a, with a network of almost 2,000 volunteer experts from around the world. Um, and then on the database side, um, the two paired fields that we have have really served us well that indicate both whether an individual record has been reviewed by a human and whether that human and, and what that human decided. Um, and we've certainly run across databases with birds that just have one or the other of these fields, and it makes it really hard to integrate the data quality on this. So when we think about data quality in eBird, we, we really try to think about it all the way across the, the project and all the way across the apps. Um, and that goes from how we design the data entry, the data output, um, and everything that we incentivize. So. Um, so I don't think about data quality as kind of this one piece, but really as a core philosophy across everything that we do. Um, and that has multiple different layers. So um, this is a, and most often what we're, what, what we're all thinking about when it comes to data quality is, is the species ID correct. And that's certainly one of the main focuses for eBird. Um, and I would say that it really starts um, 
really starts at the beginning before someone even joins eBird. So, so we invest a lot in trying to get educational apps out in the birder community to make sure that at the time where people join eBird, they are um, good birders already. Um, so that, that gets to the Merlin bird ID app that, that is supported through eBird. Um, we try to try to make sure we have observer training that happens on the front end. Um, the, the taxonomy of actual birds that you can enter in eBird is very tightly controlled and, and I would argue super, super important to just maintaining consistent data quality. And that needs to include not just species, but higher level taxa, genus, families. If all you can tell is you saw a hawk, we wanna make sure someone has the ability to report that and not try to force it into some more specific category. Um, where the rubber meets the road is really on the data entry when, when someone goes and compiles a list. Me sitting in my backyard here, hearing hairy woodpeckers and downy woodpeckers and entering those in eBird when I'm not presenting. Um, we, um, we provide me with a, with a spatio-temporally ac accurate species list, we hope, um, and that kind of sets guardrails for what I can report. Um, and then we give immediate feedback if I try to report something rare. Someone just reported a great spotted woodpecker in North Dakota. We would immediately hit them with a flag that says this needs a photo. This is unusual. Um, and then when that happens, that encourages the vouchering of the record. Um, those outliers are flagged and all of them are reviewed from this um, set of volunteer experts that we have. Um, and then kind of the final stage that happens behind the scenes kind of between the website output, um, the experts are deciding what appears on the web, what appears on those maps. Um, but when it comes to like the Magnolia Warbler migration model, um, we can really high grade that data and say, we're just gonna use the very best checklists. Um, because we're collecting so much, we can, um, we can choose not to use a lot of data that, that doesn't have the highest science standard. Um, and then we can also weigh observer expertise. We can measure observer expertise in terms of how many birds people are finding relative to what we expect. And then we can weigh those, weigh those observations differently um, in those models to make sure that um, the people that are really experienced in finding a lot of birds have sort of higher weight than those who might be using eBird for the first time. Um, so that sort of amounts to kind of three phases in the data quality process. There's the education kind of before you start, the data entry phase that we probably spend most of our cycles um, trying to get as perfect as we can. Um, the expert review that happens right after that, that really depends on this willing volunteer network. Um, and then the final phase of sort of how we prep the data for science and how we recommend that others prep the data for science. Um, and the other piece that I sort of glossed over already because eBird collects everything in a checklist context, uh, things like date and location are we don't think of those at sort of the observation level. We think them of them at the checklist level. So I go and walk around my local park, collect my list of 41 species, and that those all have a date and a location associated with them. Um, so we try to, we actually have sort of a separate data quality process that applies to the whole checklist um, and basically set those checklists either to meeting a public standard for science use and for display on the website or not. Um, and that relates to checking the date the checklist effort and metadata and the location. Um, certainly one of the critiques of eBird is that we, we have some fuzziness in our locations that, um, that isn't always uh, evident. Um, every, every observation is described with a latitude and a longitude, but increasingly every observation is described with a latitude and longitude and a track of everywhere that you covered. And now that we're collecting tracks and something like 40% of the data now have tracks collected from the mobile device. That allows us to be much more uh, precise about what areas were covered and how the, the actual area covered relates to the, to the single lat long that we use to represent a point on a map. Um, kind of an additional level, you know, if you think about the observation being the core piece, the checklist level being above that, then there's also this piece of all the metadata that people collect along with the species. Are they getting the, are they recording the age and sex of the bird they see? Are they doing that correctly? Are they recording behavior um, and various other things? Um, so ideally we'd be um, applying the same rigor to all those, all those fields. I will say that we, we focus a lot on kind of the most important ones and some of these don't get the same attention in the data quality world that, uh, that we hope we, 
we'll bring to them at some point. Um, the final piece though is that we do collect a lot of media in terms of voucher photos and voucher recordings. Um, and increasingly we're turning to um, machine learning to help us make sure that all the gray cheek thrushes are correct. And in the example below, which is a real world one, the second one over is a Swainson's thrush and our model has identified it and outlined it in a red box so that we can um, flag, flag that meaningfully to the user in the future. Um, the one all the way on the right has a green box. So our, our vision model agrees with that ID. Very similar to sort of how the INET um, vision models work. And then just a, my short wish list for the future is that right, right now we do a lot of our vetting based on species assemblages. So I'm in Boston. We have a list of birds that are expected on this date in Boston. Um, but as we do more and more in the tropics, we really need to have very fine scale um, range maps do, do kind of a second tier of vetting. Because um, we, we need to balance both the migratory behavior of birds, um, which is really relevant here in Boston, making sure that I'm reporting the, the expected species on the expected dates. Um, but for resident species in the tropics, we want to be very, very fine scale about which side of a river boundary we're on or, or what the elevation band is on a certain ridge. Um, there are opportunities to, to use the data to flag more outliers. Um, we, our process is not as transparent as I wish it would. Um, since we have a lot of experts working behind the scenes, we'd really like to kind of bring the users in um, on the review process a bit more. Um, and uh, yeah, so. So that's, that's where I am. I guess we turned it over to. Thank you, Marshall. Scott. Yeah, we appreciate that very much. Uh, uh, Scott, if you would uh, come next, Scott Laurie from iNaturalist. Uh, I was going to present next. I think Scott's won the, uh, iNaturalist has won the award for the most popular app. See if he um, pops in here. Sorry, I was muted. Um, let me uh, share screen. Uh, share. Can you guys? Oh, go. good. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, good. Cool. So, yeah, Rob asked me just to sort of describe how how data quality works on iNaturalist in one slide. So I think I have four slides, but I'll try to go quickly. So assuming um, figure A there is just sort of the basics of how iNaturalist works. You know, someone takes a, a photo, oftentimes they don't know. And I think this is where it's different than eBird. Oftentimes the observer doesn't know what they're looking at. And there's a, always a photo or a sound associated with that, which can be reviewed by a community to put an identification on that. And then that's the sort of, you know, high quality data. So we currently have 58 million observations, but there's a subset of them that we call research grade, research quality. And uh, figure B there, it's kind of a schematic of how those fall out. So, um, you know, of all observations, 8% of them are missing things. So they might be missing the location or things like that. And we put those in this bin called casual. So pretty much everything, if it has enough data, starts in this needs ID category. And if it's missing attributes like a location or a photo, or it gets kicked into casual. And then similarly, the community, if, if something's captive, either the observer or the community will kick that into casual. And that's another 5%. So then we end up with 80%, 87%, which is in this, what we call verifiable, which is means it has all the data, it has all the attributes we're interested in, it's not, and, it's, and it's wild. And then in order to get in, out of this needs ID category into the research grade qual, uh, category, it needs two things. It needs um, this community support. So we call that the, um, community ID, and it needs to have an identification that's finer than species. So our research grade category really conflates three things. It conflates um, accuracy, you know, is this data correct? It conflates precision, is this data precise? And by that, we mean like, does it have a species level identification? And it also conflates relevance a little bit because we don't include captive stuff. Whereas you could argue that, you know, a properly identified, properly annotated observation of a garden rose is still High quality, but this is just how our naturalist works. So our research grade, grade bin conflates accuracy, precision, and relevance. Um, so precision, an example, would be like an uncertain location, right? Um, maybe a, a point that has like a, un, an uncertainty of a thousand kilometers. Um, and then another thing of precision would be course identification. So maybe it's just identified to plant or just beetle, right? Um, whereas for data accuracy, um, 
so the rest of this talk, I wanted to kind of focus on data accuracy, not precision, not relevance, but I just wanted to say that, that our, our research grade label kind of conflates those things. But in terms of um, just the data accuracy subset of, of our, or, or, or component of research grade in iNaturalist. So one thing that could happen are there's location errors and things like that. So let's say someone enters the wrong location. The onus for curating that stuff is really on the observer. It's not something the community can really, you know, notice if obviously outliers are noticeable. And that's something where if like an observation was in the middle of the ocean, the community might notice it and flag it and that would kick it into that casual bin. But it's not like a community type thing. And I do think there's probably a lot of location errors that are just unnoticeable because it's, you know, it's perfectly reasonable for the species to be there and they're probably going notice. But the big one is um, kind of like Marshall was saying is identification errors. And that's something where because of the shared media, the shared evidence, the onus really is on the community to sort of discuss and, and come up with a high quality, an accurate and also precise identification. And then the third bucket, which I just wanted to mention, but I don't want to dwell on is this whole business of fraud, you know, where someone could fake a data point. Um, you know, obviously, again, outliers are noticeable um, if they faked, you know, a wild elephant in California or something. Um, I think there it's really an incentive issue. There's just not a lot of incentives to do that. You can imagine if iNaturalist was really critical for making like government policy, there might be new incentives. I'd say at the moment, our only real incentives for that are, are a lot of students who have their grade depends on it. They might fake data, but it's generally a very, very small portion, uh, we think. So, so the, the bulk of it is this identification um, issue. How do we come up with accurate and precise identifications? Um, and, and remember, for that research grade quality chart that I showed, that requires that we have something we call the community identification. And the definition of a community identification on a naturalist is at least two people agree. And if there are any disagreements, then more than two thirds of the people agree. So in that sub figure A there, you know, that's a situation where that one person said seven spotted lady beetle and the other person said Asian lady beetle. So they disagree. So the, the observation would get kicked back to the common ancestor, which in that case would be uh, the ladybird family. And it would be up to more identifications to kind of pull it forward into one of those two. So it, in that case, because there's disagreements, you'd have to have more than two thirds of the people um, agree. So for example, and I looked through some observations this morning, but so for example, B there, um, and I can't see this because the Zoom <laughs> videos are over it, but I'm gonna pretend. I think that the deal is the original person identified it as the wrong species, but then three people came in, including me with, the, with a new species. And the original identification there is labeled as maverick, meaning they're sort of out of step with the community. But because it's three to one, that's greater than two thirds, that has shifted the community ID over to, to common shiny woodlouse. So they're out of step with, I think it's um, common, common pill bug. So does that make sense? So, so three people went with common shiny woodlouse, one person went with um, pill bug, three, is greater than two, three to one is greater than two thirds, so it got shifted. Um, sometimes maverick, people are maverick and they're not wrong. So here's one, this uh, uh, figure C there. So here someone said this uh, genus of mole crabs, Emerita, and someone else came in and agreed Emerita. And I came in and said, no, 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 this is HIPAA, which, and I know I'm right here. Um, and then a third person came in and said, no, Emerita, Emerita. So here I'm out of step. I'm the maverick one, but I know I'm right. So this is actually, it's not research grade because it's at the genus level, but if this was at the species level, this would be a wrong research grade observation. And so generally what I did in this case is I looped in C kangaroo who I know knows this group and would back me up. And I did this this morning, but hopefully she's already chimed in. But again, that's kind of how our naturalist works is you sort of try to bring in more people to conversation and sort of have a discussion about it. Um, so, but that's an example where I'm maverick, but I'm, I'm right. <laughs> I know I'm right. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to do this morning was just do a little bit of an, an audit, a very mini one to kind of, trigger this discussion I want to have about how accurate is iNatural data. But um, so I took crustaceans. So we have about 159,000 research quality crustacean data. This is a group where I happen to be really into IDing them on the top identifier on the site of crustaceans. So what I did is I, I pulled randomly 500 um, observations this morning and just went through them. And I have a pretty good sense, even the crustacean that I don't know whether, you know, I know who else identified them. I kind of know the community. Um, so I went through all 500 and I did find two that were research grade observations that were wrong, right? So this is, they were both happened to be wood lice. But so like A there, um, which is kind of interesting. So this person identified as nosy, nosy pill wood lice, and then someone else came in and asked, they said, how do you separate this from what it actually is? But then they added an identification of the wrong thing. 
It's like, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't add an identification if you actually, it, it doesn't know, but he did. So um, this was a research quality observation that was wrong. And I went in and added the proper ID of um, common wood louse. And then secondly, this is a similar example where this is a South African, in South Africa, and someone said, uh, Porcelio Scabber. It's actually, I don't know if you guys know Tony Rebella, but he's like a world-class botanist. So it goes to show even experts can be wrong, but he doesn't know his wood lice because he came in and said, Porcelio Scabber is actually a different genus. So I came in and you can see in both these examples, I pushed them back into needs ID back up in, in A in the genus level and in B in the, in the family level, but they did exist as research grade observations for a while and that's, that's a problem. So, um, but I calculated from that tiny, tiny, tiny sample, you know, 0.4%, but obviously this probably varies across the tree of life. This probably varies across um, geography and obviously I could be wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm not, there's no real authority and that's one of the problems. So I just wanted to leave with like two kind of questions that we're sort of struggle with with this is one, one It'd be great to be able to estimate this. What is the quality of iNaturalist data? And what's the proper way to do this? Like, obviously, you can imagine orchestrating little audits like I just did on greater scales, but you know, we have to come up with people who, we have to come up with the ground truth. Who's right, right? And we know even the best experts are often wrong. I mean, I was looking at, to come up with that example with the hippo where I was maverick, but right? I have like 18 pages of maverick identifications and usually I'm wrong. I mean, it is, everybody's wrong. And that's kind of the beauty of this. Um, but, but I think that's one important thing is how can we estimate, how can we get an accurate estimate, estimation of what the quality is? But then we're just really working with a quality quantity trade-off. It'd be very easy for us to pull on a knob, push research grade into a higher quality realm, but we would have a quantity trade-off. And you know, what's the proper balance there? What is a tolerable amount of inaccurate data for scientific purposes? And I'd, I'd be curious how things like iNaturalist and eBird compare to like the museum specimens, which I know, you know have a lot, of, a lot of areas as well. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. That was great. Very helpful. Uh, it's great to hear from the people running a project, how they're thinking about what needs to, needs to go next, how they're, the questions they have, and hopefully people in our audience will be engaged and help solve these problems. All right, uh, up next, uh, John uh, or Christy, are you there? If Christy's there, why don't you go next, Christy, because uh, you have a citizen science project that's more like the ones we've been hearing about. And John has something quite different and we'll, we'll hear from him last. So if Christy sure. you can go, okay. that'd be great. Um, let's see here. Uh, our, um, the metadata for, for any given survey is one of the metadata pieces is the experience level of the surveyor at the time they did that. Um, and that's proven helpful through the years. It's definitely a source of incentive, kind of like Marshall was talking about. There's a lot of competition. So some people, it really matters to them that they they're an expert level surveyor. But we have um, people using the reef data for in analyses for scientific papers have found that it always, almost always, they use the entire data set for whatever they're analyzing. Um, it's really just specific times when you would exclude the novice data. Um, but more recently, we've been working on a project. Marshall's actually been helping us, um, a group um, doing, looking for some embedded assessment ways of identifying learning and citizen science. And so for REEF, we're trying to do um, better understand how the, the learning experience and can tell us something about um, how much quicker people learn and how much better they get. So it's kind of that expertise weight that, so we're trying to fine tune that better because right now, some people don't bother to ever take the experience level exams, but we know they've done a thousand surveys and they're you know better than any other fish taxonomist out there, um, but they don't have that expert in their rating system. So having, that's one of the things that in REEF we wanna try and incorporate and do better with. Um, we have always, back when the scan forms, the scan forms were visually looked at, but really we missed a lot of things. With the online data entry, we were able to do a lot more of that on the fly, um, making, you know, missing data. There's no missing metadata anymore, which is nice. But also this um, error checking, and this um, is spatio-temporally controlled a little bit, um, similar to the, I, the eBird model, but it's, this is another area where we really have data at all yet, 
nothing gets flagged because it's based on what's already in reefs data set. Um, so the user is asked if they're reporting anything that is rare or has never been seen in that area, um, they're asked to confirm. If they confirm it, it still goes through to their submission. Upon submission, the reef data don't go automatically into the database. We have a data quality backend error checking that we do before it goes into the data set um, officially. And so this is a, just a screen grab from some recent survey submissions from Hawaii. And you can see, we just have a quick glance of who the surveyor is, what their experience level is. So this is a expert level four and when he got his experience level, um, she's a level two, so that's a novice, Judith level five. Um, and then these flags are just things that are either rare or new sightings for our database from you know, the big island. Dennis is reporting something here that's never been seen. Um, he already, because they showed up, he's already said, yes, I confirm that. But then before we put it into the database, I'm certainly gonna write to Dennis and where Marshall has 1900 volunteers on the back end, it's actually just me and one other staff person at Reef that does all this. Um, I do all the tropical um, error checking and she does all the temperate error checking. And um, so I would write then and say, hey, that's cool, you saw so-and-so, tell me about it, how do you know for sure that's what it is? Um, so that's the error checking and quality control that we have um, so far. And the, what I wanna end with is two, and I've talked with Rob about this a fair bit the last couple of years, because I've been thinking a lot about it, is the impact that changes in technology and ta just changes in taxonomic knowledge are having, because reef's been happening for almost 30 years. Um, so this is the progression of the, for the Caribbean, the main field guide that almost everybody uses for fish. And it was first um, published in 98, or in 88, had 374 species. And the most recent printing that everybody uses has almost double that. Um, so that definitely has some impact on our fish surveys because in the early 90s when the program started, there just wasn't, we just, it's not that the species are newly described, some of them are, but most of them are just, we're getting better at identifying them. We're getting better at figuring out where they live. We're getting better at just, you know, defining two different species. So this is one issue. And then this other issue that we're thinking about a lot is technology. So cameras and underwater light. In 93, when we first started doing surveys, almost nobody, you know, you carried a camera if you were an underwater photographer. And if you went diving at night, you carried a light. You didn't carry a light during the day. And the light you carried was this pitiful, not very good, super heavy, bulky thing. In about 2012, there's, there was kind of a shift in underwater technology. It became cheaper, better, way better, and much more accessible and easy. Um, these cameras on the left, most everybody that does reef surveys now have them, something like that. Little tiny hand lights that everybody uses now, no matter what, day or night. And those are helping us find things that you nev never would have seen before. This is me holding everybody's cameras coming up from a dive. Um, this is the camera table. You know, these, we're not underwater photographers. These, this is a trip full of reef surveyors. And they're just using it. You can see the, the picture on the lower left. He's got his camera dangling there. He's doing his survey. But this is taken in Fiji. And it's you have to have an underwater camera to be able to really do a good job of creating a complete checklist in tr these super tropical Pacific areas. Um, and just to show that it doesn't even, it's not even hard to take good underwater photo photos. So I'm not, I'm surveying. But this is just a reluctant, I swung by a, a um, sea fan in the Solomon Islands, I think this was taken. And I knew that this little pygmy seahorse was there. This is about two centimeters. I didn't even spend any time. I just snapped the picture. And there's this amazing, beautiful Denise pygmy seahorse um, that I took with that stupid little red $400 camera and no strobes or anything. So this is kind of what we're not confronted with because that kind of makes it sound bad. But you know, back in, in the 90s, if you saw something you didn't know what it was, you like sketched it and you tried to remember and think about what it was. And now you've got pictures, you've got all these online field guides that show many different pictures and this collaborative learning style. So all those things bringing together is increasing our ability to get better, faster and more complete with our checklist. Um, 
social media, of course, too. I think we talked about this briefly in our in our breakout room, but Facebook is is pretty big, and we've got for this kind of you know, it's a informal. It's not an app per se, but we have um, these fish watcher groups on for all of our regions, and it's just an amazing community. We've got professional taxonomists who are in there, and that just like Scott was saying, often sometimes the taxonomist will come in and say, oh, that's a whatever. He'll just brush it off and he'll think he knows right away. And then all these other amateurs come in and they're like, oh, well, but what, you know, because they're really spending time looking all the time and they, and then they come to a consensus and, and it switches around. So one fun example is this way back in the nineties, we would have thought if you looked underneath a ledge in the Caribbean, you saw this reddish, tiny, little, tiny fish. This fish is probably, I don't know, it's bigger than that pygmy seahorse. It's probably six centimeters or something, or um, we would have just said, oh, it's a rusty goby because that's what the book said, small, reddish, under ledges, upside down. But in reality, there's all these other rusty goby, blue go goby, pygmy, dwarf. And you, re the only way you can tell is if you get a good photo, but you can with those little underwater cameras. So now we're getting these, and this is an example is back and forth. Um, Benjamin Victor is one of the leading fish taxonomists and and you know it, it's a great community of back and forth and it goes to that so it's not on our platform per se like it is for iNaturalist but it's this kind of thing that sits off to the side and then helps Frank who's the surveyor make sure that he gets his his ID accurately um, and so I'll just finish by saying that for us um, photos. So we don't, reef surveyors don't submit any photos. That's kind of on my wish list. And I've talked to Rob and Marshall and Jeff about this for a while, wanting to try and that's our next step is being able to, you know, all these reef surveyors are getting amazing photos and we can both capitalize on that to use for voucher specimens, um, but also to start to build those machine learning tools that um, are becoming so prevalent and helpful to be able to help just up the game on fish ID. So um, we're thinking about, you know, how do we communicate with our surveyors on their best practices for photo curation and getting those photos so that they can go to, you know, be of use in some sort of um, curated database. So that's what I have to say about that. Thank you very much. That's terrific. We appreciate uh, a look into the fish world and how it's different from these other worlds. Um, and uh, it's great to see the long historical perspective too. I think that was really cool. Okay, I'm going to call on John Sullivan, who's going to talk about a, a one-person effort. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, spill the beans a little bit by saying that uh, John is on a mission to do environmental monitoring. Um, uh, because um, that's what people said was a good thing to do, but academics don't do it. And I should also comment in general that academics aren't leading these projects, at least the US projects. These are people who are more committed to the community and to biodiversity conservation, I think, who um, wanna, wanna do wide scale things. So here, here comes uh, John. Um, I'm hoping he's gonna take over the screen. Uh, there he is, good. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Rob. Sure, yep. everyone. Um, and the, yeah, I, I'm, this, is, um, this is my um, personal account of a, a one-person citizen science project. Uh, so I'm not sure whether it really is citizen science at all. And it's, um, I'm an academic ecologist, but this is all the work I do in my um, in the gaps in my life to make sure that I'm observing my own city. So um, I, I'd be keen partly just to get feedback on where things are at um, and where I go to next. Um, let me just start. So I'm just going to show you a couple of um, slides up here. There's nothing as a full presentation prepared, but this is where we began. Can everyone see that, that there? Mom, yep, that's there? good. Yep. So, so, so when I... Um, I joined, I'm, I'm at Lincoln University in, near Christchurch here in New Zealand, the South Island. And uh, when I joined Lincoln University in 2003, I'd already been kind of in my head that if, if I had a stable job in a single location, I would want to contribute to ecological monitoring at that area long term. And um, this was pre-smartphones, pre-anything. So I started out um, just riding my bike to work 
and on a piece of paper on my bike, just marking down um, the numbers of a variety of uh, common, easy to identify birds uh, in three different sections of my route, um, which would be the city out into the rural countryside and then back into the town of Lincoln. This is a, um, at the time a 12 kilometer route. Um, and so I've got all three human forest birds, all wild birds bigger than starlings, with the little ones I wasn't good at at the time, uh, all wild mammals, everything that's killed by a car on the road, and all butterflies. And that's where it started. So that was 2003. Uh, smartphones came along at one point. Um, I realized that I could do much better than this. So now I have a, um, a phone attached to my bike with a, um, a little microphone, Bluetooth microphone attached to my helmet. Um, and I geotag every one of these things I see in counts and distant distance bands uh, everywhere I go now uh, on bike rides and on my weekly runs. Um, so um, that's um, contributing to knowledge of what's around in my city. I also, um, when I'm sitting in my office, I've just stopped doing it now, but I was doing it before. I have my window open um, and I'm writing down a series of things which I can hear, um, which make obvious noises. In this case, um, this is um, the bell, there's a bellbird. Um, FG is a fantail, native birds that make obvious noises. Um, so I can also keep a track of things going on around me uh, in 20 minute intervals um, from my office. Uh, it's all got horribly obsessive, <laughs> um, but I've, I've now got like um, well over a million observations of the area and I'm, I'm starting to work through the analysis and trying to figure out how to share them properly uh, so other people can, can use the data. To get, get around doing this though, so clearly this is, uh, so on the right, there's just an example of my little shorthand. So the window means the window is open. Uh, it's in 20 minute intervals and there's a little shorthand about um, the birds uh, or it could be a cicada making a noise, how far away it was, the F1V is um, far, one, vocalization, um, M is mid, there's distance spans. I, I won't go into details, but just to know that this is possible. Uh, so in, in, a, in, a, in an average week uh, or average month now, this is what I'm doing. So in the um, I should probably put a scale on. This is just a Google map image of Christchurch city um, and Banks Peninsula. So down on the bottom left, uh, as far as you get to the southwest is Lincoln Town. Uh, in the um, top, the most built up area at the top right is the middle of Christchurch city. It's about 15 kilometers, 15 miles between those two sites. Uh, and this is what I do every month. So the blue colors, uh, my bike rides. So the main blue one in the middle is my bike to work which is now 20 kilometers because I moved house further away from town, which would work out badly. So now 20 kilometers, the light blue ones are done once a month to add some replication and the orange and red ones are my weekly run routes. Um, and so I get about 700 kilometers worth of uh, distance done every month, um, geotagging everything I see. Uh, and I do birds and mammals and butterflies and variety of flowering plants and when they're flowering, big fungi, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and so the next one, um, to that this gives you what what the geotag observations look like for for one week so i end up carpeting this landscape with observations uh, in a week of what things are here um, and if i start to look at where they are is um fantails which are new zealand native bird also um so a species also found in australia but here's just a run route where I go and you can see this pattern start to build up over time of where they are as anybody who does this sort of stuff will see. Uh, in this case, it's um, they, they are concentrated where the native trees are being planted in the city and they're not found in suburbia. Um, so patterns are starting to come out of this as I go. Um, where I'm at though, so, so, this is not, so this is not publicly available. Like what, so I'm, I'm a big mad keen fan of iNaturalist and I'm, I'm part of the iNaturalist New Zealand team. And I really love iNaturalist for biodiscovery. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm one of the biggest um, observers and identifiers in New Zealand on iNaturalist, but uh, this is something different. I, I see once I can identify common things reliably, I start to incorporate them into my monitoring and I record them everywhere I go. Um, and that's a little different from, I'm not a bird or I don't do life lists, I'm not after every species I can find. Um, and um, I'm, I'm instead, once you've got to grips with a few common things, you can start to record everywhere you, everywhere you see them all the time. Um, the other part of the tech I just want to show, so here's, um, here's what it looks like in practice. And again, this is all, uh, this is all being based around the, the principle, let's use whatever existing tech I can find to do what I can now, um, rather than wait for eDNA to come around or um, new apps to be developed. I just use what off the shelf stuff I can use. So um, let me just pop my phone on the screen. 
little iPhone. Um, can everyone see see the phone there? Yep. Um, so I, since I was doing my PhD, I've been using FileMaker. FileMaker is a database. It's um, easy to use. Uh, it's only on Apple, and Windows, and iPhones, so it's not on Android, unfortunately. But they have this FileMaker Go app where you can set up any kind of thing. It's like, like, I'm not advocating this is the best thing ever. Um, it's just what I use. So I can start a, in this case, a root. Um, I can set up the root, which um, like yesterday I did my standard center city run loop. I can go through. I won't go into the details of this, but um, there's a bit of how, when, where, what kind of stuff I set up before I start. So what's the weather like? What's the environment like? Off I go. Um, and then I can type or speak. So if I'm hiking or running, I can push a button. Every time I say Blackbird Lift Med 1, then I've got an audio note with a geotag and a date stamp on it um, with that, um, that code on it, which I can then build through. Or if I'm um, in a car, as a passenger in a car, I just go Blackbird Lift Med one and I've got a blackbird left mid on the side. Um, it's a blackbird like that, and I've got that stored in there. Um, and that's it. Uh, and then that gets downloaded into my computer. And then right now, so this is, I've been doing this for ages, knowing that technology will eventually catch up to me. So now I've got um, something like 500,000 uh, audio notes um, waiting to be transcribed. So I'm just working through Amazon's um, AWS transcribe system right now to, to optimize it to go through my notes. So. Uh, just these last couple of weeks, I'm on study leave at the moment, working through this, trying to get it out. Um, but um, this is an example. Blackbird song, right mid one. So that one works. So I'm going through just checking this stuff and finding common errors that Amazon makes, and then I'll be able to um, have the R scripts that turns it, turn this into proper spreadsheet data, and then I can start to ship this up into the wild world. Agrisibi um, parasitica, right close. So oh, I photographed that Agrisibi, of course. So it doesn't have agrocybe. So there are a few like like scientific names I'm having to train it on um, as it goes through. Still right, calls right mid about two. And then it adds these random words in the front. So, so it's great. It's like 10 years ago, I couldn't do this at all, um, but I started recording the audio recordings. Now it can actually transcribe this stuff fairly well. Um, but things like E2 gets changed and whatnot. Um, so I think that's all I need to do by way of introduction, but, it, but um, I, I do, using this series of shorthand and being able to have an app which can just record audio notes and geotag them as I go um, with the GPS running. Um, I can easily do on average about 500 observations a day, which I've been doing for many years now uh, in a standard set of taxa, which I predetermined that I will observe. And so I'm coding this, um, this area uh, with observations and the next step of course is to start uh, releasing that data to other research and start to make sense of it all. Um, but it's possible, right? And so the next, next question for me is how do we how do we sort of take all the stuff we're doing to the next level and try to get more people out there in the cities doing this kind of stuff, um, filling in the gaps, reporting how nature is changing in their cities uh, before um, eDNA and um, other tech comes over and starts to take over doing that. eBird does great for birds, but you know, we need to be doing it for other taxa as well. I think that's all I have to say. Um, I'll be keen to get feedback too. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I hope uh, other people are uh, as wowed and as excited by his, uh, his efforts to try to just gather mountains of data. And because it's over such a long period of time over known routes and uh, different taxa involved, I think it's gonna be very interesting um, in terms of looking at ecological relationships, which is often one of the things that our um, present approaches uh, don't do a very good job at. Um, so uh, um, thanks everybody, uh, Marshall, Scott, Christy and John to give us very different views of what's happening. And I wanna uh, just emphasize that uh, my perspective on this is we're at the very beginning of what can be done. The technology is changing very rapidly. The taxonomy is changing. The engagement with people, we're all learning uh, in, in different communities and different ways to engage with people and get them involved. And I, I, I always think about it as when they first started to design bike, bicycles, it was three wheelers and wheels of different sizes and we hadn't converged on what works. And it's not gonna be as simple as that because we have different communities, different taxonomic issues. But what I am really encouraged upon, about is the different approaches and how people working very hard have, have gotten them to work. They're producing important data, very, very important uh, data for GBIF. Uh, they're doing much better uh, in my mind than the academic community is and can. 
So um, with that in mind, I'm, I want you to go back to that Google Doc that I put out there and look at a different tab uh, on the bottom, go and, and look at that different tab if it's not available on your screen and uh, make some suggestions about what you're learning, what you're thinking about data quality for yourself, for your own projects or for other people's projects. And so we'll just, we'll just take a couple minutes for people to enter things. Uh, maybe you can describe something you heard about today that inspired you or that might be useful for what you're doing. Um, and why am I asking this? Because um, as people involved with standards, our goal is to make it better and easier for people to share information and to understand what different projects are doing. So the degree to which we can eventually offer tools and, and ways of thinking about this data, it will make the data along the whole pipeline from observer to project manager to um, uh, all the way to an end user, somebody who wants to just see data or someone who's trying to analyze it in a special way. It'll make them easier. It'll make it easier for those people to take advantage of all the all the projects that are out there and to integrate information. So I, uh, if, you, uh, if you have any ideas or suggestions, um, we're in the age where transparency and um, uh, multicultural approaches are, are proving that that's the way to think about things. Um, open things up, let people, get people involved. Um, I, 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 um, academics have been very skeptical that amateurs could ID things and yet today, in the, in the projects we heard, we realized that amateurs in some cases are doing much better than the professionals because they're out there looking. They're really concerned, they've got great eyes, they've got great experience, they know how to look. So it's that idea I think that uh, can push us forward as a community, as a group of citizen science projects, uh, as a group of people interested in biodiversity to um, uh, make it more likely that these incredible creatures and this beautiful world of ours will survive the, the, uh, the great challenges we're facing with climate change and other environmental changes. So if you have ideas, please share them there. Um, and um, it is the case that uh, Libby and I and Peter are talking and thinking about this all the time. And it may be we come back to you and ask you for more suggestions or try to uh, have some kind of interview where we can learn more about what you're thinking and where things are going. Um, my perspective on all of this is the one limiting factor for people is infrastructure. You can't hire enough people to help you. You can't hire the people you need to do the, do the work you wanna do. Um, uh, I've watched eBird grow and grow and grow from four people up to maybe 30 now that are in the office uh, contributing. I'm not sure if that's full-time equivalents now, but uh, it's grown tremendously. Um, and uh, when I think about each of these projects and what a small number of people are contributing, I'm just astounded. It seems that uh, I should be able to raise money and support infrastructure, whether it's for a new, new, new database or for it's uh, money to do eDNA or uh, DNA barcoding or for uh, another taxonomic support. Um, and for many years, I have been very, dis very uh, worried because all the academic literature says that taxonomy is going downhill. Academic taxonomy is just going by the wayside. But I think it's been iNaturalist that I first learned about and hearing uh, Christy here to, today, these communities are building relationships uh, between taxonomists and community people. And that conversation is leading to advancements and leading to curation. Everybody knows that the taxonomic model is a, is a nightmare. But these people are actively working on straightening that out and, and deriving standards that are so important in making the data of use in the long run. So I think that citizen science, even on that most knotty problem of taxonomy, is really making a difference. All right, I'm going to be quiet and let people uh, work on that sheet. And I'll give you a couple minutes. And then I'll come back and introduce Peter um, uh, Brenton, who's in the business of integrating data and keeping track of uh, very uh, uh, active uh, groups in, in Australia to get his perspective on what technologies are coming along and might might prove useful um, for integrating citizen science data and understanding data quality. I don't know, Scott, maybe I can get you to chime in. You have people there, uh, I think, uh, who have identified 100,000 uh, records, as much as that. 
I mean, in different tax and different people are no very involved, but that whole ID community has grown to be so large, something I'm not that familiar. How, how big are some of your uh, contributors? What are the contributions they're making? Um, Tony might know. I think it's, I think the top identifier is something like at least above 100,000 observations, maybe a couple hundred thousand observations, but it's still a tiny, I did a recent blog post on the NAT blog, but it's still a tiny portion relative to observers, but I still think that's healthy because it's a different kind of community. But, you know, a longstanding thing is how do we grow that community of identifiers? Because mm -hmm. some people mentioned City Nature Challenge. I mean, there's some of these BioBlitz activities, which I think are able to really lift the ceiling on the number of observers. But what can you do to lift the ceiling on the number of identifiers and high quality you know, expertise and identification? And we, I don't have a good track record of ARA figuring out how to incentivize the professional community, which has a lot of that expertise to participate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's um, a, I see that as a big challenge, and but one that uh, is doable. We just have to think about it, push on it. And I think if uh, I've been working the past year with some academics reviewing INAT data, and at the end of the day, they actually had a great time. They were enjoying it. Uh, and they were making mistakes and they were getting corrected by people all around the world, which was fun. They enjoyed that. And I think uh, uh, in some ways it's, it's, it's uh, looping into those professionals who do know, who have experience, and they tend to be people who are, who are not community oriented. They've been in their own little worlds, not, not outward going. They're not part of that younger generation that is much more uh, into sharing and, and much more familiar with social media. All right, we've gone Rob, over. Rob, I noticed line. there was a raised hand, Deb. I didn't know if you wanted to unmute yourself and ask a question or comment. I, I, well, I'm looking at the lovely things that are starting to appear in here. I, I do think there are some opportunities to, to keep developing some of the ideas we heard here. Like, there's another project that wasn't mentioned here, and I won't, I won't say it by name. It's, it's, and it's not a, um, an app or anything, but it was an, an early effort where. Um, this decision was made at the top level to hide uh, determination differences of opinion from the public. And the idea was evidently the public was complaining and they were saying, what? You scientists don't know what this is. Don't you know the names of everything? I mean, like, so this was a publicly funded thing and they didn't want to lose their funding by getting bad, bad press. So they had the taxonomists under the covers, you know, come to an agreement about what determination would, you know, make the public view. And at the time that that decision was made, I expressed it. I said, you know, this is part of why we run into a problem with the public. When we try to hide differences of opinion, we make it seem like oh, everything is known. We make it seem like everybody agrees on what this is. And I think it's here, you can see some of the things that we were shown today, much more powerful to have the differences of opinion be transparent. Yeah. Yeah. Much, much more powerful to have that conversation with the public so that they can both learn in both directions, as you just pointed out, Rob, right? Um, yeah. it, it did make me wonder how many of these projects have a sort of online to local uh, strategy built in, this notion of where do we build more identifiers and where does that community come from? So just happenstance, for those of you who know me, this is not an unusual thing for me, but I haven't met a stranger yet. In Chicago, at one of our conferences, I met someone on the street. Turns out she's a uh, does like PR relations and some sort of strategic communication. So she said, what she found would be really important for us to do with these is make sure that you tie a, a local physical event where people actually see each other to the online community, that there's a connection between those two worlds, and that that's maybe a potential strategy some people could use to build that sort of identifiers world maybe like meeting your local chess players in person you know rather yeah. than just online yeah. and the other one that I, I hadn't thought too much about yet further I just put it in there for those of you who know the NASA space apps challenge I wonder if there's some strategy like that that could potentially get people involved to take tackle some of the big questions you've asked here about things like data quality or growing the number of people who can do IDs and things like that Thank you for sharing. That's really helpful. Um, you're always thinking on the social side, which I think is really where the problems lie. For the most part, um, we have great technology now. We have great, uh, uh, great science. We have tools, but it's, it's sort of both getting uh, 
working with people to feel, have them feel included and engaged and then convincing the rest of the world that we have problems with biodiversity loss. We're, that's what we face. Okay, uh, Peter Brenton is um, the person on our team who is the master of technology. And um, I should say for biodiversity informatics, and I should say that Peter comes from a background of computer science. He doesn't come as a biologist or something like that. He comes with the, with the background of actually producing useful products. And uh, he also comes with a, a great gift of interacting with people. Um, and his, a lot of his job uh, involves working with all kinds of user groups and observers and then with software engineers and um, with the uh, administration uh, you know, funding. So he's, he's at, the, at, the, at the center of a lot of things that go on. And uh, from my perspective anyway, Australia has led the world for a long time in their biodiversity informatics. They've been better at inventing things, inventing standards and sharing things. Um, and they've gone around the world and helped develop things like um, GBIF and uh, um, other standards. And so um, I think it's very exciting for me to hear what Peter's thinking about where this is all going in terms of uh, sharing data quality. He's going to talk much more at the project and data set level than at the record level. We've heard a lot about the record level, but let me just turn it over with, to Peter and let him share what he's thinking. And hopefully there'll be a little time at the end for people to chime in and share their, uh, share their ideas. Okay, take it away, Peter. Thanks, Rob. And um, I have to correct you on a couple of things because I'm, I'm um, uh, not actually a programmer and I'm not sort of as tech savvy as, <laughs> as you suggest. But um, uh, I do work for the Atlas of Living Australia and, and feel very privileged to, uh, to be part of the Atlas team. Um, we've been working on, as Rob said, infrastructure development um, in the biodiversity sector for probably about 10 years now, a bit over 10 years. And um, uh, very, very closely associated with GBIF and the work that they're doing. Um, so I just wanted to sort of share some, some um, aspects of what we've been doing, um, I guess, as a data aggregator and uh, also some of the work I've been involved in as a member of a, an international team working on a, um, a standard for citizen science um, data, which is, I didn't initiate, I've only sort of joined the team and been part of the team. And uh, that, that's called uh, PPSR core, um, or public participation in scientific research. So I'll just um, share my screen. Hopefully the, um, the connection will be stable enough to get through this. Um, and oops, I think I just, there we go. Can you see presenter, sorry, presenter view? There we go. Got it, it looks good. <clears throat> You're all, all set. Right. All set, yeah, good, good, good. Um, I can't see anyone now, so uh, um, I might have to just call out if, if something goes wrong. Um, so in the Atlas of Living Australia, we're, we're a biodiversity data aggregator and we're currently um, aggregating uh, 90 odd million records from about 825 different data sets. 42, 46.6% are actually from science sources, uh, 65 different data sets. So it's, it's a very significant um, contribution to the overall record count. Um, in GBIF, uh, 1.6 billion records, 54,000 data sets, um, and 34% of those are actually um, from citizen science sources. So it is a major contributor. Um, this is just a view of the kookaburra in Australia, um, two species um, and an aggregated, uh, an aggregation of about 500,000 records from 53 different data sets. And um, 
a very large proportion of those and certainly um, the, the top um, record counts of data into this, this particular view come from citizen science sources. Um, and you know, this statement there without aggregation views like this are simply just not possible. Um, they provide a, a scale of perspective, perspective that you just can't get um, from individual data sets effectively. So from an, an aggregator's point of view, I thought uh, perhaps a, a, a supply chain view of this might be used collection from lots of different sources, uh, single observation, record observations, uh, many citizen science data sets are uh, record based, um, but also survey based data as well is a, a major um, source of biodiversity information. They, uh, they flow into aggregators like the ALA and, and various sister facilities around the world. Um, GBIF is a super aggregator of, um, aggregator of aggregators. And the data is then used, extracted out of these facilities and used for um, produce, producing knowledge products uh, through analytical uh, processes. Um, those sorts of, of, of analyses inform areas where uh, new data collection can be focused. Um, they also inform, uh, go into product catalogues, which um, are accessed by researchers, government, um, and resource managers, industry, and so on for a whole range of different, and those also drive uh, needs for new data collection. But the only way that this supply chain can work smoothly is when you've got standards um, that connect everything together. And um, you know, involves individual data, data sets, data sources, um, you know, being collected for an individual purpose, um, don't actually necessarily need standards. Um, they only standards only become important when information is shared and um, and accumulated and then used in, in aggregate form. So, um, so just a, a few facts uh, in terms of citizen science. More than eighty percent. I, I can tell you exactly how much uh, uh, of citizen science projects have a biodiversity subject. And it's by, by far the, uh, the highest proportion of, um, of project um, volume in the world, or in citizen, world of citizen science. Uh, in Australia, I did a, did a count sort of relatively recently, um, it was about 96% of the projects in our project catalogue actually um, relate to biodiversity. A third of biodiversity data globally is from citizen science sources. And um, it's a major source of ongoing new data. So um, uh, mounting traditional data collection expeditions is uh, very expensive um, and citizen science offers a way to, to grow that um, in a more continuous and frequent sort of basis. Citizen science, um, as a practice and movement is continuing to grow uh, for a whole range of reasons that have been mentioned in previous talks. Um, availability of technology, accessibility, um, public interest, whoops, sorry. Um, and also data consumers are seeking greater confidence in quality of citizen science data. So we've had, had sort of comments about, um, you know, trust and, and um, uh, or lack of trust in the quality and also that fitness for use decisions depend on documented searchable metadata. People can't make decisions about its suitability for, for their own needs if it's not um, actually, if they can't understand how it was collected or how it's been curated and managed and, and uh, um, how quality is being treated. So a bit of an overview of PPSR core. Um, it's actually a set of global transdisciplinary um, 
so data metadata standards for citizen science. So it, it goes beyond biodiversity. It covers uh, health and social and um, ge geological and atmospheric and uh, space and various other domains. So um, uh, biodiversity is an important part, but obviously just a part. Um, the objectives of the standard is really to uh, define and publish a set of, of metadata and data schemas, um, mainly as data exchange standards between platforms, um, which fulfill a bunch of use cases and, and those um, at the project level being able to share project information between catalogues to make projects discoverable um, at the data set level, uh, similarly, but um, with data catalogues. And uh, it's also about defining a set of core domain uh, domain based schemas, um, which can provide um, off the shelf guidance for um, uh, science citizen science practitioners so they can be more consistent and um, compliant I guess in, in when they're designing projects um, to enable spatial and temporal consistency in data collection so that you can do um, the, these sort of spatial and temporal views at scale and um, uh, it also to enable aggregation and provide readily usable schema it's basic, basically not looking to build a, a whole new standard necessarily, but to leverage um, and build on and reuse existing standards as much as possible. It provides a framework for existing, existing standards and a way of, of um, uh, filling the gaps between existing standards in a uh, more citizen, citizen, citizen science centric sort of use context. Um, and it builds on existing implementations too. It comprises four main components. Um, there is a project um, metadata model, and uh, that's really descriptive information about projects and, and uh, enables sharing between catalogues. There's a data set metadata model um, and also observational data model, um, which basically sets uh, core attributes for domain-based schemas. And then there's an overarching uh, sort of common, what's been called a common data model, which provides a framework uh, that links all of these together uh, when you're designing campaigns or, or clusters of projects. Um, the background, it, it's, it's been a pretty lumpy process. The, uh, it, it started in 2010 uh, with a, um, an initiative of various US-based citizen science practitioners and Data One getting together. Um, in 2015, it sort of had a, a bit of an initial push in 2010, and then in 2015, it, uh, uh, it sort of went down downhill. 2015 was reignited. Um, and became international with EXA and AXA involvement uh, and various other players. Um, and because it's sort of been an initiative that's been based around a lot of voluntary work, um, it's been very spasmodic. Uh, we've had sort of significant pieces of work done in 2017-18 and also this year. Um, OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, um, have had an interest for probably about five or six years and provided uh, support and input into the process. Um, and it's also had some involvement from the Worldwide uh, uh, Web Consortium uh, via um, CSIRO standards and uh, operators. Uh, in June 2020, we, there was a sort of big re push to reinvigorate the project team and we've had an injection of new blood into it and um, it's moving along quite well now. Some of the achievements, um, there was an initial project schema published in 2010 um, based on the SITSI.org uh, uh, and SIS data schemas. Uh, in 2017, the 
uh, the Citizen Science Association Working Group um, produced a report to the Citizen Science Association Committee and um, that defined uh, the, the framework that I just went through. Um, 2018, a European Cost Action uh, Project did a revision of that um, uh, 2017 report and introduced um, entity structures into the process. And then um, in 2018, we had a, a, a workshop that defined a sort of general governance framework for it. We also set up a GitHub repository and uh, did a, a full model schema description in JSON. And in 2020, this year, we've um, uh, got a sort of revision of the published version. Uh, we split the model, the, the full model into component pieces. Uh, we've done, done, done some um, uh, work around methods for maintaining the uh, artifacts as well. So this is just a, a bit of an outline of some of the artifacts that we've developed. There's an ent entity relationship diagrams for different components. There's uh, spreadsheet based definitions of uh, attributes um, and entities within the model. Um, we've got a uh, ETL, uh, ex extract transform sort of process running that can take the spreadsheet information and convert it into JSON and XML uh, serializations and also working on JSON LD and RD RDFS um, serializations for that as well. Um, the GitHub repository was stood up. There's a sort of initial content in it that's currently being revised and um, there's also a website and uh, wiki being developed as well as part of the, the sort of supporting information. Uh, there's also a few working documents. Um, whoops, sorry. One of the things in terms of data quality, one of the things that the, uh, the standards actually looking at is um, various aspects of data quality and how best to represent those within the standard itself. Um, and they deal with things like accuracy and precision um, and completeness of records, consistency of, of, um, of application of methods and um, you know, looking at, at ways that validity um, can be described and also um, uh, picking up sort of temporal aspects in um, the records as well. Um, so taking taking into account things like uh, presence and absence. In terms of the standard, we've still got several things to do um, and we're aiming to get to a point where we've, we can publish it all um, and make it fully available as soon as possible. The, the estimated completion dates on uh, the right hand side there are um, uh, hopefully um, pessimistic and we hopefully we'll be able to get them done earlier. Um, but yeah, there's still work uh, refactoring the, the GitHub repository and, and the current wiki pages, the um, completing the website development, completing the, the serialization extracts, um, formalization of governance and um, and also um, there's a fair bit to do around um, approved approved controlled vocabularies and and having sort of version management around those and also how we publish and promote it so those those are activities still to be done platform owners that have been involved in the process project to date and this is um, you know not not a, um, a closed shop, it's open to anyone who is interested and wants to participate. Um, so SITSI.org and SciStarter have been involved from the start. And since 2015, um, uh, the ALA, European Commission, and uh, more recently also the European Citizen Science uh, Association's project finder team um, with Margaret Gold have um, have been sort of involved in it and interested in, of course, whatever's produced. So, 
Um, other key contributors, Wilson Centre and Bowser in particular has been a major driver from the Wilson Centre in uh, reinvigorating the project since 2015 and driving it along. Uh, the cost action uh, project team in Europe and uh, also Open Geospatial Consortium. Several individuals have also been involved um, and um, as I say, it's open to anyone. An example of, of sort of working interoperability, I guess, between platforms at the moment. Um, and hopefully this doesn't look as though it's too, um, you know, sort of Australian centric, because it's not actually the, the, uh, the main center of gravity is actually around um, uh, SciStarter um, in the US. And, and um, we've had a, a sort of working collaboration in sharing project metadata between our BioCollect system and uh, in Australia and uh, the SciStarter platform. So there's project sharing. Uh, SciStarter is also connected with sitsite.org and, and the Federal Catalog of Citizen Science Projects. Um, there's, uh, I think also Zooniverse and Anecdata have, um, have come into the, the um, uh, linkages there with SciStarter as well in more, more recent times. Um, our BioCollect platform in Australia is providing sort of filtered outputs into um, an education-based uh, project catalog called Star Portal and, um, uh, and also a couple of other sort of um, uh, views and um, subsets. European Citizen Science Association are just in the process of launching their, uh, their new project catalog. Um, the EU citizen science one, and um, they're also looking to connect into this uh, ecosystem of project catalogs soon. So I'll just finish with a few discussion points um, that perhaps we can focus on a little bit going forward now. Um, so how can we increase the awareness and uptake of Darwin Core as a standard uh, amongst citizens? and science practitioners in um, the um, applicant, oops, gosh, sorry, don't know what happened there. Um, so, and particularly in the applications that support citizen science practitioners. What aspects of the PPSR core do you think, you know, there's, there's some aspects that you think aren't? What can or should Tadwick do to adopt and promote the PPSR core? Um, and given that, that biodiversity is a major, um, you know, major part of the of citizen science um, activity, um, it, it's useful, I think, to incorporate PPSR core. But how? How should we, as an interest group? Um, or perhaps a working group or work, uh, work more closely with the continental associations. And um, yeah, what can, what can Tadwig do in the citizen science space? What are our opportunities and what should we focus on? So I'll just leave, I'll finish on that. And hopefully these will be a few questions that we can, we can perhaps uh, continued discussion with in the remaining part of this session. Over to you, Rob. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for giving us this overview. Um, it's at a level that most of us don't think about too often, but it's, this infrastructure is central to the idea of being able to um, share information. And citizen science will gain in its stature to the degree to which it, it is able to do that. Peter has these nice set of questions here, but I think uh, Peter it would help a little bit more for the main people in the audience anyway to say say about how individual projects uh, might might benefit or uh, contribute either to what, what's what's in it, what's in it for them on the one hand, but how can they help too to um, uh, adopt or share in this process? Should they should they lay low until um, the, the um, most recent work is done sometime next spring, or are there things that that uh, they could they could do now that they should be in discussion with other people? Um, 
What are your thoughts about that? I think I think for existing projects, there's definitely things that can be done now. Um, the the um, spreadsheet-based standard, I guess, is is available um, for people to use, and, and for those that actually provide um, you know platforms supporting um, you know projects or or um, clusters of projects. Um, Implementing what is there now would be, um, you know, probably a good thing to do in readiness for being able to share more effectively um, the data and and also the metadata to make make the information a bit more, um, you know, sort of discoverable and aggregatable. But um, uh, if anyone would like to contribute more to to the work of the PPSR core project team that's operating under the Citizen Science Association's uh, working group. Um, you'd be more than welcome to join that group and, and contribute. Um, any, any sort of um, you know, additional effort is, is welcomed. Um, uh, Peter, sorry to cut you off. I just noticed that we're kind of at the, the hour here. So um, if... Um, if there are some closing thoughts on your end um, to put out there, otherwise I think we'll move into the um, the kind of bigger closing ideas. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. I, I don't know that I, I can really say much more other than um, there is for, for platform and application owners, um, you know, the standard as it exists right now is is usable. It's not um, it's not sort of in a polished published form, but it is usable in its current form. And um, you know, if you wanted to sort of retrofit um, existing infrastructure to fit that, then, then um, that's certainly doable. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think it's uh, for anybody who's listening and is interested, I think the, the first step is just to follow up with Peter. Uh, he's your, and he'll put you in touch with people or uh, documents that can help you um, uh, uh, answer your questions and see whether there's um, it's time for you to to uh, join in and uh, be part of the effort to to uh, build up this standard. Um, I wanted to uh, particularly to bring up the subject of data quality again and um, ask. Um, Peter to talk a little bit about that. Um, I, when I think of uh, data quality, I, I certainly agree with the, what other people have said, the, the, the whole um, issue of taxonomy and identifying species is always the top consideration in, in biodiversity, citizen science biodiversity projects. What can we do um, in terms of um, testing the data quality and, and telling people communicating to people what we've done to do that. In other words, Scott showed us a nice example of a, of a test he did. Um, and I don't think he has a way to share that in any standard yet, but it would be nice if he could simply say, hey, look, this is what I found. And over time that will take root and be expanded to other taxa and so on. Or likewise, how do we represent the methods that are being used to maintain data quality? Those are other aspects of data quality. So we have these general categories here, and they are um, very similar to all the things I've read when I've read about business data quality in terms of categories. That's fantastic. But I'm thinking about much more practical steps uh, from the, maybe from the end user's point of view or from the point of view of, of a project manager. And just to, um, uh, looks like we have a couple of uh, questions coming in, but also I wanted to put in the chat there the, um, the doc. So if, if you do have to pop off, because um, we're coming up on time, uh, feel free to put any follow-up thoughts or, or lingering questions in, the, um, in that link, in that last spreadsheet there, and we can follow up with you if there's something to um, follow up on, or if there are things for us to think about as a working group going forward. 
um, I'll just put that plug in knowing that people might have to get going before long. I've just put a link into the, um, the Google Doc folder that um, contains all those artifacts too. Feel free if anybody has a, a question to uh, turn on your mic and share your thoughts or, or um, question one of our speakers or one of the other co-hosts. I see it's 8.05, I'm not hearing anything. Um, I'm, not, I'm seeing thank yous and people moving on. If uh, nothing else pops up here, I just want to close by thanking everyone for coming and participating and sharing their ideas. Um, it's uh, we lacked uh, we lacked the European contingent and the contingent uh, some contingents from other countries. I wanted to share the fact that the um, Indian Biodiversity Portal is part of a group sponsoring uh, citizen science biodiversity projects in India. They're having their own conference in the coming weeks. Um, so it's, it's spreading and exactly this kind of work should, uh, should engage, should be interesting for them too. And I'll pass it around, pass it along to them. Um, uh, and I also wanted to thank the team that supported us as we were having this um, conference. Thank you, Ellie and, and uh, Debbie. Is there anybody, anybody else that I've forgotten to thank? Are we, are we all and, set? And William and Ellie, I think, yes. William and Ellie, okay, good. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks to our speakers, I appreciate you helping us out. Scott and Marshall and John and um, Christy, thank you. Thanks to you, Rob, too, for moderating us and uh, keeping the discussion going. All righty. Good. All right. Stay in touch. Share your ideas. And um, hopefully we can get more funding to support all the great work people are doing. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, everyone. I'll stay on if anybody has one last question that I can answer. I'll, I'll be the last one to go with Ellie. I was gonna, usually the presenters, we get the presenters just if they wanna stay back and have a bit of a debrief, but everyone but Libby's already run away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's late for people or they're busy. It seems to be the I think the debrief is a good idea. I didn't mention that to people, so they're off to the next thing. If you're here in, on the East Coast, you might be hungry if you hadn't had dinner. I have a question. I, yeah. Uh, or you might just want to go. Did we do okay, uh, Deb and Ellie? Oh, yeah. I think somebody said oh, they yeah. had a question. Did somebody say they had a question? Yeah, know? sorry. That's, that's Elizabeth. I'm in the middle of a goshawk, so it took me a while to get my gloves off. Um, oh. <laughs> that's, that's not something we're expected to hear. Well, let's welcome the videos off. <laughs> see this. Um, I was wondering, there was when there was a session on the extended specimen yesterday, and they mentioned the fact that they were thinking of bringing in observation data, and there was a mention of possible citizen science data. And I wondered if you guys had any thoughts on how that might occur. Opinions. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, uh, that's what a lot of the museum people like me have. We have opinions, but we don't have a lot of experience with that type of data. Um, I have experience with like 
field uh, journal notes and that type of data. But how do you like, I do have a grad students now who I take into the field collecting and instead of doing a field journal, oftentimes they do an eBird list. So I'm trying to figure out how to like record and make sure that data is connected to my specimens. And um, so I think that's a, a good point. And um, that uh, uh, the uh, mushroom community, I know people, uh, spoken with people in Denmark and in New Zealand who are making those connections and the new project in the US that's been uh, chugging along now for a while. It hasn't gotten significant funding, but it's got an avid group of people called Fundus, F-U-N-D-I-S. Um, they actually are very much uh, working on and developing the linkage between an observation on iNaturalist or another platform with a physical specimen that could go into a museum of some kind with uh, a DNA sequence. So they're, they're um, at the point where they have uh, funding for people that want to do that. And so you can apply and get a little money and then send specimens in and they send it off um, to Canada and then it shows up in the bold database. Um, so their goal is to, to connect all those things. Um, and um, I don't, <clears throat> the projects that I'm familiar with, uh, on the citizen science side have not gotten to that point where they have a, a, a common infrastructure to do that. But I think Peter um, deals with that kind of problem all the time because of the heterogeneity of the kinds of data that he deals with. So uh, the software, uh, the BioCollect software, and um, some of that has been now um, adopted reluctantly, I guess, in some cases, but it has been adopted by the European Union. And there's a team of people that are, are building that out. Uh, I guess when they did that, they lost some functionality they had, which was hard to do. But um, I, I'd say that that is a growing platform for managing biodiversity data of many flavors all around the world. Um, and so if I, if I, uh, I would send you to Peter, first of all, and see what he said. Okay, thank you. We want to, oh, 